Hello everybody, in today's video, not that I make videos any, every day anymore, but in this video, I'm going to be talking to you all about gardening here in Nicaragua. I'm going to teach you the main things that I've learned now that I'm much more comfortable with plants and honestly, gardening in Nicaragua is amazing. Like, it's one of the coolest things about the country. There is no winter. The chance of you being able to grow a portion of the food you eat, it, it's actually realistic. Nicaragua is an amazing place for growing and farming. It is amazing. It's full of volcanic soil and all the sun you could need most of the year. For now, I'm just going to show you these three plants, okay? This is a peanut plant. It's a really, really incredibly unique plant because it moves every night, it shuts all of its leaves and closes, and the fruit of this plant, so to speak, is grown underground, which makes it very safe. <laughs> One of the big problems you'll encounter here in Nicaragua, if, especially if you're not using pesticides like me, not, I'm not trying to like grow organic food, I'm just, I like getting a sense of the balance of things, and, and if you just spray pesticides everywhere, you end up causing a lot of problems in the future, and I've learned a lot about that. So one of the things that you need in your plants is just kind of a natural resistant to bugs, which is why Kalala here, passion fruit, peanut, and also the big leaf plants are all some of my favorites. They all use different mechanisms to protect themselves. And the peanut, for example, grows its stuff underground. And it also is a really crazy plant because it makes these flowers and then they get pollinated, and then it kind of makes this wire that grows down into the ground, and then after two months, it makes a peanut. So it like injects the ground with a peanut. They're really, really, really cool. So that's a Kalala right here, and I have honestly never had a Kalala until the point of making fruit, but they're so fun to grow that I don't even care. These are all Kalala. This is Kalala. All of that is Kalala. I, I really like Kalala. It's just the coolest, most badass plant I've ever seen. So now I'm gonna rant to you about Kalala because it's, it's just freaking amazing. Let me, let me show you some things. You see these ants here? Those ants basically bring bug eggs and all sorts of stuff, and they like to farm things on plants. But Kalala, as you can see there, Kalala has some little ant nipples for them. And instead of bringing aphids onto the Kalala plant to make the nectar, the Kalala's like, wait, 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 ants, how about I just make the nectar for you? And this means that instead of ants bringing on bugs and cultivating them like cow, the Kalala just provides for the ant, and the ant doesn't do that. So you'll still get bugs. Like if you can see here, this is something I'll get more into as well. But for the most part, they're basically immune to bugs because this, all that this needs is just some water running over it occasionally and then that's it. You just need to clean the leaves, and there needs to be a way that the leaves get cleaned, and then a lot of the problems go away. Kalala is an amazing plant. As you can see, like, it doesn't need a whole lot of soil, and it can get pretty big. Like, this plant here is the same as this vine. You see how thick it is right now? These things live for, like, I think it's like six to eight years, something like that. And now, th this is one vine that has done most of this. But I planted a lot more, I got a bit overzealous. See, there's another vine here, and then there's two more vines over here. And then I saw how much they covered, and I was like, I want to blot out the sun. So now there's another one, and another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. Bunch of Kalala. Too many Kalala to count. Actually, that's not true, there's 11. Now, the last plant that I'm going to talk to you about actually isn't back here. So I'll show you in a next clip. 
Here are some more big leaf plants we have. And what's cool is I basically have big leaf plants for every stage of their life cycle. Their size can vary tremendously. This is some kind of weird dwarf guy. These all came from the original, like the same mother as far as I know. But this one, for some reason, just always stayed really, really tiny. And I say really, really tiny because if you look over there, there's two things I haven't shown you yet. They are the, <laughs> the, what this plant does if it has enough water is insane. They get like, they're trees. You see this? This is actually taller than I am. Their leaves are really, really big. Isn't that crazy? Just for reference, look, this and this are the same plant. And for some reason, this one right here, this is like six months old. It just, it doesn't get bigger. I, I don't know why. Meanwhile, this one's like two years old, right? Absurd, right? And these are just really, really cool because as you can see, they just add so much green and they grow really, really well here. Um, I'll get into some of the care next because now that you see these three plants, I can really elaborate more. <laughs> see, there's Kalala everywhere. There's string to the thing up there and Kalala growing up these strings and oh, I, I just, I'm Kalala crazy, let me tell you. But there's reasons that I appreciate all of these. Now, let's get into those reasons. Here are some big leaf plants that I have inside near this fountain. And you can see they're a bit lanky. They get a bit tall because they don't have enough light, but they're really pretty. And they actually were transplanted here smaller than this and with less leaves, but now they've gotten into the dirt, even though it's just regular dirt that I just kind of keep wet. And they look really cool. So I mentioned that these are all my favorite plants because they thrive and they have bug resistance. And there's a reason for that because Bugs here, where I live at least, are a big problem, specifically airborne bugs. It's true that there is no winter here. There's not a period of time that's so cold it's going to kill the plants. However, there is a, a winter, and there's actually sort of two winters, <laughs> if that makes sense. They're not as extreme, and you can, man you can survive your plants through them in, in most cases. But this is something I had, I just didn't know existed really, because I'd never really been in a tropical area. I'd, I'd always lived in a place where there was a winter that froze everything. You couldn't have a plant for multiple years if it couldn't survive frost, right? And a lot of most plants actually, surprise, surprise, cannot survive frost. And what ends up happening here is there's a really dry season and there's a really wet season. And there's two points basically where you're, there's so little sunlight available that a winter-like effect happens where it's been raining so much that your plants haven't gotten enough sun and there's so much fungus encouragement because of how wet everything is and the lack of sunlight killing off the fungal spores and the, they make the conditions right for fungus to thrive. And these funguses can be devastating and really destroy um, a lot of different plants. So most plants can't really survive multiple weeks without sun. They like it, how it's like this, this is bright, right? But that's because it's, it's actually not cloudy. There's just some clouds that are blocking out the sun. But when it's really rainy a lot, there's way less light, and this will actually kill a lot of your plants. Um, especially if you plant things right then, thinking, oh, the rainy season is going to start, it's great for my plants, right? Then you won't really have much luck, because it's actually quite devastating to plant something, have it be in transplant shock or whatever, and then it have to make it through two or three weeks of just rainy weather without any sun. Um, that's enough to really devastate a lot of plants. So the other winter-like effect you get is the opposite. And it's ironic, actually, because 
all of the sun being available all the time is amazing. But at the same time, the plants, like these plants, right? Kalala here. They, they need water occasionally going over the leaf and draining off of the leaf. And that's why most plants actually go to sleep and they perk up and go like this. And if you pay attention, you notice that in the daytime, they're like this. And then in the nighttime, they go like that. And then in the daytime, they're like that. Kalala does that. Peanut does that. And big leaf plants do that. And you'll find that the plants that don't do it are less, they have more problems with bugs, as I mentioned. So why is this such a problem? Why, why does there have to be water flowing over the leaves? And let me show you, because it's really obvious once you see it happening. Now, between what you're seeing and the camera are millions and millions and millions of particles of all sorts and almost infinite variety of bug eggs and fungus and molds and even plant seeds in the air just suspended floating around. There is a lot of life starting material just floating here. And as you can see, it's kind of windy. This is the front part of the house. So the air brings in every kind of bug imaginable. And when there's no water to clean off the plants, you can see that objects start to accumulate. Dust starts to accumulate. And this dust acts as a glue and a home for all of those bug eggs. And this is the beginning of bugs that can pass the bug resistance that these plants naturally have. Kalala is a highly bug resistant plant and as long as it has water going over the leaves and not staying on the leaves, you don't even need it that often, like every couple days, that's enough to prevent all of the problems because what can happen in the in the dry season here in particular is spider mites can be really really bad um, a lot of the farms and places here use a lot of pesticides so it's true that there's and so because of these widespread um, pesticide usages people aren't used to dealing with the mites uh, naturally um, because when you have a farm it's really hard to actually wash everything enough because in order to deal with a lot of these airborne bugs, you have to physically do something. It's not about a chemical or heat or anything. It's about physically moving the bugs is enough to kill them because they have to be in a very specific place to be protected and safe. And they will die if they're just naturally moved from that place. So even something as simple, if you simply go like this. You take your fingers and you just touch the plant and you focus on just going down once down the center of the plant. That's enough to prevent a future bug outbreak. That's all it takes at the right moment in time before the bugs have turned into their adults and they've made eggs and they've laid eggs and they've laid eggs. You can prevent all of that from happening just by the right physical action at the right point in the timeline, okay? So water is uh, the easiest way to do that. This damage you can see here, actually. Sorry, it's kind of hard to tell. See how it's like got spotting and you can see some specks? That's all because this leaf has become attracted, attractive to bugs because of the presence of dust in these things. So all that one has to do is this, and then the leaf is gonna be fine. It, it, it's really simple to actually deal with, but think about having a whole entire farm with hundreds of acres or something, and you can't physically touch every leaf. You can't even pay people to physically touch every, every leaf. So people get really tempted to use um, pesticides to kill the mites, and it does kill the mites, the problem is that it then also breeds an environment for the mites to grow resistant and then just t 
take over. So what happens if you just try and grow things without physically doing what I showed you is this very pesticide resistant mite population just exists in the air and it's all over the place. So if you don't have some kind of protection against that, and like I said, the physical stuff can't go wrong. No matter how resistant the, the mites get to your you know, pesticides, that doesn't matter if you're you know, washing the plants and the mites can't let their life cycle progress multiple times because their whole civilization gets wiped away by multiple floods every other day, right? That, that's what you need to keep them in check. And I talk about the mites because they will devastate your crops um, when it's not rainy. During the dry season, if you grow beans and you don't use pesticides, your beans will literally, the leaves themselves will be totally eaten by millions of tiny, tiny, tiny little spider things. They're like, you can't even see them. If I look at them, you just see like a red dot with like a little fuzzy bit around the edge. And that's why it's really easy to look at the plant and think that the mite damage is actually some kind of fungus, but it's not. It's actually caused by these tiny little spider-like creatures. Um, I can actually show you some of them, so I'll do that right now. Here we go, I managed to get the camera to focus. They make like spider webs basically. So you can see there's like hair on this leaf and it looks dusty, right? They make the leaf kind of sticky. And if you can see, there's one on the edge right now. Those little red dots are red spider mites. There's like black ones too. And then there's also a good kind of spider mite that eats these. So there's actually ways that you can have so many of the good ones that you don't really need to worry about these guys because they'll never get that populated because they get eaten by your predatory mites. But I don't have any of those. And this is exactly what plagues a lot of different crops here. So if you're trying to grow something, you need to be able to deal with this, especially if you're not using um, pesticides. And like I said, it's actually pretty easy to deal with. Just simply doing that is enough to save the plant in most cases. I've actually, I have a test plant that w I let, I let it get totally devastated, okay? So it was about the size of this plant, but with less leaves. And as you saw earlier, there were a bunch here, right? I let them take over everything. Everything was covered. The whole entire plant was covered by webs. All right? And then I just cleaned it, gave it time, gave it what it needed. It looked sick for like a month. And now you can see these leaves. These are new leaves that replaced the, all the dead leaves that it lost. See? It survived. Kalala is a...